Today's video is sponsored by Pickers Grip. Stop dropped picks and pick rotation while playing with Pickers Grip. Made with all natural ingredients in Virginia. Check out their website to order. When you support my sponsor, this also supports my channel and it's very much appreciated. What are some of the greatest rock amplifiers out there ever? Well, stay tuned because I got 14 of them that I'm going to share with you here today. And by share with you, I mean tell you about them. So if you are watching this video hoping that you are going to get to hear 14 different amplifiers, you are going to be sadly mistaken. And I am going to laugh at you because I think it's hilarious. So that said, I normally shoot these videos back in the dungeon uh, where I am surrounded by guitars and amplifiers. However, seeing as I was out already out here working on another video and some other stuff and already had everything set up and most importantly because I am nice and comfy here in my chair, I decided that I would share with you my list of 14 greatest rock amplifiers with you from here for a change. So without further ado, let's get to it. Number one, Marshall JCM 800. If I were putting these amps in order, this one is still the one that would absolutely be number one on this list or any list of greatest rock amps ever. The JCM 800 defined an entire era of multiple genres of music. Rock, hard rock, heavy metal, pop rock, and all kinds of other stuff. Back in the 80s, if you were a guitar player, Marshall JCM 800 is the amp that everybody wanted to have. It's been on countless records. It is still used to record countless records today. Both the original vintage versions from the 1980s as well as the current 2203X uh, reissue version that Marshall still makes today. And really, there's not a whole lot of difference between the two. Marshall JCM 800, greatest rock amp ever. Seriously, how many other amps out there can say that they define an entire era of music? like the JCM 800 did. Number two, PV 5150 and 6505. A lot of viewers were pretty upset with me that I didn't include uh, these amps in my greatest heavy amps video here just uh, about a month or two ago. Uh, personally, the reason I didn't include it is because while it certainly is very popular among many, many heavy metal players, I happen to own a couple of them myself. I've always thought of it as, as it was a much better sounding rock amplifier than it is a metal amplifier. I just never thought that it had quite enough bottom end for it to, you know, to, uh, you know, for it to be able to hang with some of the other great metal amps out there. But as a rock amplifier, it is one of the best ever. And when, you, of course, if you think about the fact that it was originally designed by the legendary genius of an amplifier designer by the name of James Brown. Uh, designed it specifically for Eddie Van Halen. And of course, Eddie Van Halen is regarded as one of the greatest rock guitar players to ever tread this planet. This amplifier has been used by many, many, many people ever since. Uh, you can still find them out there on the used market. And, uh, you know, they're actually still pretty affordable on the used market today as well. Uh, the 5150s, of course, are no longer in production as they had to change the name to the 6505 when Eddie Van Halen's endorsement deal with PV ended and he decided to go start his own company in EVH. And despite what you hear on all the forums and uh, you know, all the other people talking about the differences between the 5150s and the 6505s, I have it on good authority directly from PV themselves. They're the same thing. Number three, Soldano SLO100. I've talked about this amp here recently as well. The Soldano SLO100 is another legendary legendary amplifier. If you're not familiar with the work of Mike Soldano, the SLO in SLO100 stands for Super Lead Overdrive. Mike Soldano had a reputation for modifying Marshall Super Leads and eventually just decided to come up with his own amp design called the Super Lead Overdrive. And another little known fact about the SLO 100. Speaking of Eddie Van Halen, there's a period there in about the late 80s and early 90s, very, very short period, when the tone from Eddie's old vintage Marshalls was finally beginning to deteriorate uh, from so much use and so much lugging around and you know, everything that he had done with them that he was looking for something new. 
before he had gone to PV and before the 5150 was designed, he actually walked into Mike Soldano's shop and fancied an SLO 100. And that is actually the amplifier that he used on the For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge album. And I believe he even toured with it as well. So between his old Marshalls and between the PV5150 era, there was a small little sliver of time in there that Eddie was actually a Soldano guy. Number four. Speaking of PV, they also had a couple of amps called the Classic 30 and the Classic 50. These amps started out, at, like most PV amplifiers, as uh, American-made amplifiers and uh, are still out there. They st actually do still make them today, uh, though today they are made overseas. So, mm -hmm. But the older American-made versions can still be had. I've never actually heard this or read it anywhere but I have always just kind of gotten the impression and assumed that PV came out with these amplifiers specifically to compete with the Fender Hot Rod series because there's a lot of similarities between the two. The biggest difference between the two however is that the PV Classic series sound great. If you're if you're a rock guitar player and you're looking for a new amp, don't sleep on the PV Classics. There's the 50 watts, the 30 watts that are still out there, and PV just recently, in the last couple of years, came out with the 20 watt MH version, which is a small 20 watt studio head version uh, that actually gets pretty loud and you know plenty loud enough still to play a lot of gigs. Number five, Crate Blue Voodoo. I used to own one of these and selling it was probably one of the dumbest things I ever did. I had, I had one for the very first year they were made. They, they had a version with the one year where they had what is now known as the cartoon logo. And I had one of those in the matching 412 cabinets. That was my very first tube amp. And it sounded absolutely awesome. I keep telling myself I'm going to go buy another one. But, you know, the truth is I just, I just don't need 120 watts right now. <laughs> And there's also the, the small, minor, little uh, problem of where am I going to keep it. When a lot of people hear the word crate, they think of solid-state amplifiers, you know, cheap little solid-state amplifiers that a lot of people don't like the sound of. I personally am not a crate hater. Uh, I've had several of them on top of the Blue Voodoo that I owned. But the Blue Voodoo was played by a lot of pro-level players. Uh, namely C.C. DeVille from Poison. Uh, Sammy Hagar actually had a signature version of it called the Red Voodoo. Dave Mustaine from Megadeth. Uh, Dave Mustaine and Marty Friedman, both from Megadeth, were both playing Blue Voodoos at one point back in the 90s, uh, among others. I always thought of the, Voodoo, the Blue Voodoo as kind of a poor man's Marshall JCM 900. I heard a story once upon a time that before Eddie Van Halen went to Peavy, he was actually in talks with Crate about uh, the blue about what amp eventually became the Blue Voodoo. This was supposed to be Eddie Van Halen's new signature amp. Eddie's demands for an endorsement deal were more than Crate was willing to put up for him, and Eddie subsequently went to Petey. However, Crate still had a fantastic amp design on their hands, and they still wanted to put it to market, so they renamed it the Blue Voodoo from whatever the previous name was going to be, and Send it out to the stores and put it on the shelves, and it's sold like crazy. You can still find the Blue Voodoo dirt cheap on the used market. If you're looking for a good solid tube amp, go find yourself a Blue Voodoo. And then sell it to me when you're done. Number six. The Mesa Boogie Mark Series. Mark two, three, four, and fives, all the way up to the, the, you know, the five is the current generation, but now the fives have also included the, you know, the now very well-known John Petrucci signature. Mark series amplifiers have been around for decades, since the late 70s. James Hetfield recorded a lot of the early Metallica records using the Mark II C+. Carlos Santana, James Hetfield, Izzy Stradlin used a Mark III on the uh, Appetite for Destruction record, I believe. There has been a ton of pro-level players that have all used the Mesa Mark series. They're very, Mark, Mesa amplifiers in general, but especially the Mark series are really, really unique sounding amplifiers because they got a really kind of a really cool, dark sound to them. They're really, really tight sounding and, you know, they just, they just work well. All kinds of records out there that have a Mesa Mark series amplifier on it that we probably don't even know about. Number seven. Marshall JCM 900 and the JCM 2000. 
And when I say the JCM 2000, I'm talking about the DSLs, the dual super leads, not the those triple super leads. Those things suck. But the dual super leads are pretty awesome and still pretty popular today to the fact that Marshall has now reissued those amplifiers twice and have now actually come back out with the Marshall with the JCM 900 dual reverb, which was the most popular iteration of that one back in the 90s. By a lot of Marshall fanatics' opinion today, the dual reverb may not have been the best version of the 900, but the argument could be so, could be made that it was probably the one that sold the most. Without getting into all, all those arguments, the reason why I included both of these amplifiers on the same entry is because a lot of people have been known to use the two in conjunction, namely both K.K. Downing and Glenn Tipton from Judas Priest, Ace Fraley, Paul Stanley, all have used JC 900s and... 2000s, you know, both in the same rig at the same time, sometimes in the same, at the same time, sometimes alternating back and forth between the two. They're both, in my opinion, excellent high gain rock and roll amplifiers. Number eight, the Fender Supersonics. I imagine there's probably a few viewers watching this video who just groaned as soon as I mentioned the Fender Supersonic. It may not be the most uh, iconic Fender amp as they're mostly known for their clean tones. Uh, however, I happen to love the Fender Supersonic. It's a great high gain rock and roll amplifier. I've played several of them, and you know, it just to me, it's just you plug into one of those things and you pound a power cord. It just screams rock and roll. Don't believe me? Go find a music store that's got one and try it. Number nine, using Kettner Triamp. If you've never seen Rush live. And I've been fortunate enough to see them live probably at least half a dozen times. Alex Lifeson's been a pretty loyal Hughes and Kettner guy for a while now. In the studio and, in of course, you know, earlier in their career, he was known for using Marshalls and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, but he's been, you know, he's been a Hughes and Kettner Triamp guy for quite some time and now even has his own signature version. Uh, I believe the Triamp itself is on the third generation and every I've played, I think I've I've played the first two. I've never played a Triumph three, but I have had a chance to play the first two. And that's one of those amps when you plug into it, you can just feel it in your chest. Those things are rock and roll all day long. Number ten, Marshall Jubilee. This is an amplifier that I think most guitar players are probably familiar with, uh, and I'm talking about the original version. Though Marshall has recently finally given us a reissue version and a 20 watt studio version of the jubilee and it's actually a pretty faithful recreation of the original however the original was produced back in the uh, mid to late 80s i believe and they were extremely rare because i think marshall only made like a thousand of them or something like that they were very very limited when they came out and they've never really reproduced them these amps were, you know, they had a little bit more grit to them than a uh, than a than a, the popular JCM 800 of, at the time, but they were also a little bit darker sounding, which was very very unmarshall like. Probably the most famous recording known with these, uh, at least that I'm aware of, is when Slash used an original Jubilee to record the Appetite for Destruction album. The model number of the original Jubilee was the 2555. Fast forward to about the mid 90s, and Marshall put out. A model called the 2555 SL that was a Marshall signature Marshall slash signature head that was of course based on the original Jubilee that he used back in the day. If you are looking for that particular sound and you can't find an original Jubilee or you did find it and you can't afford it, which is would be a large portion of us because those things go for a ton of money, look for yourself a mid 90s uh, slash signature 2555 SL because it is a, a pre it's it's certainly in the ballpark tone wise and you know you can find them uh, you know for a you know on the vintage Marshall market about the $1600 range or so you know and on the on the vintage Marshall market that's not bad especially with slash's name on it number 11 Vox AC30 TB the TB in this model number stands for Top Boost, and what is significant about this amplifier is it was the very last of the Vox AC amplifiers to be produced in the UK. These are pretty highly sought after for that reason. I have only seen a couple of them 
in person in the last 10 years or so. They're very, they're very, very difficult to find, especially since nowadays all Vox amplifiers are now made overseas in China and uh, they're import amplifiers, all of them, even the, even the expensive ones. So if you don't want to pay th many thousands for a, a vintage uh, Vox AC15 or AC30 from the 1960s, for example, but you want something about as close as you can get for a little bit more friendly of a price tag, that's why people like the TB versions. I've only seen a couple of them listed for sale on the interwebs here recently as I was looking for a friend of mine. However, both of them were listed for sale in the UK. Over here in the States, like I said, they're not that easy to find. By the way, what makes this such a great rock amplifier? The same thing that makes all the, all the Vox AC amplifiers great rock amplifiers. They've been used by people like The Edge of U2, Brian May of Queen, and uh, oh yeah, there was also that one uh, the kind of sort of big band, uh, big rock band that's, uh, that's still kind of sort of pretty popular called The Beatles, who were pretty fond of Vox amplifiers. Number 12, the Orange Rocker Verb. Speaking of British, British rock amplifiers, Let's not forget the orange rocker verb. The rocker verb is actually really popular among uh, among metal players, uh, specifically that guy from that one uh, kind of popular metal band called Slipknot named Jim Root. Jim Root's been a big, big uh, advocate and big user of the orange rocker verb for pretty much his entire career. Uh, they are on their third generation now, and he's used all three of them. For more information on uh, on that and uh, Jim Root's uh, opinions and uh, all that kind of stuff regarding his orange amplifiers, I suggest you go check out Stay Metal Ray's video as that guy is a Slipknot and Jim Root fanatic and actually had the opportunity to interview Jim Root one-on-one -on -one about his gear just, just not long ago. I'll, uh, I'll see if I can post links to that stuff down in the description. You know, but all of the metal tones aside, it's actually also a really really good rock amplifier and kind of similar to the mesa boogie amps it's got a you know much much darker sound than a lot of other rock amps out there i think it's actually probably even darker sounding than the mesas uh but unlike the mesas you know where mesas are known to have that really really tight bottom end uh the, you know the the rocker verb is not that it's not tight sounding it's just a little bit different and uh, it's got a little bit more of a boost in the like the lower mid range than uh, than some other stuff and you know that makes it really really makes them really really unique sounding so the rocker verb is a great amp but it's also an awesome rock and roll amp number 13 the randall mts series i happen to own one of these i've the one that i have is the rm22 and the rm stands for randall mts or randall module well, the thing that made these amplifiers cool was the modules these were essentially amplifiers, all tube amplifiers with a tube power amp, and then you would buy, the, I think they came with uh, various different, uh, different preamp modules that were also tube driven, uh, and basically you just plugged them into the slots, and uh, you could basically design what kind of amplifier that you, you know, whatever, whatever you wanted. Uh, they came with modules, and of course you could purchase more modules on top of that. By the time Randall quit making these, these were designed in conjunction with Bruce Egnator, by the way. Uh, I think the very first iteration of the module amplifiers were actually done by Egnator back in the early 90s. Uh, they didn't really take off, but uh, it was such a great design, and you know, so Randall got involved, and with their marketing, you know, Randall being a much bigger company, uh, Randall got involved and remarketed them and uh under the randall name and by the time randall were done with those they had like 20 something different modules out there that you could choose from uh which essentially gave you any number of combination of different amplifiers they among the modules they had modules that sounded like uh marshalls and fenders and vox amps and uh you know a few other amps and then they had a lot of their own uh their their own designs of uh preamp modules so the possibilities really were pretty endless. These amps also included uh, the Kirk Hammett sig one of the Kirk Hammett. He's had a lot of signature amps, but uh, you know, there was a specific Kirk Hammett signature amplifier that was a module head, and Kirk Hammett also had three signature modules to go along with it. I do own one of those, and also the very very popular Lynch box head, as Lynch as George Lynch had four signature models that all went inside his signature you know his signature module head the lynch box is especially a really really cool and actually really popular still today on the used market 
when Randall's contract with the you know for the module design ended, Eggnator took it over from there, and unfortunately, they didn't really seem to take off quite as well. However, Bruce Eggnator is now working with a newer amp company by the name of Synergy Amplifiers, uh, also who are also designing and building amps, uh, module amps with a very similar design, but a more modern, updated design to them. And the Synergy amps are really, really cool and uh, seem to be doing pretty well. So if you're still if you're still interested in something like this today, go check out Synergy. Number 14, the Hiwat DR-103. I could talk about the likes of the Rolling Stones and the Moody Blues and Pete Townsend, but the truth is, when it comes to Hiwat amplifiers, I have two words for you. David Gilmore. David Gilmore was an avid Hiwat DR-103 user, particularly back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, in Pink Floyd's heyday. David Gilmore is regarded as one of the greatest rock guitar players ever. I don't think I need to say it, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to anyway. What was also very, very unique about the DR-103, uh, all high watts, for example, uh, for that matter, but the DR-103 in particular, most other big high, high wattage, 100 watt tube amps, you know, when the more you turn them up, the more they break up, the more they distort. The DR-103 stays clean at high volumes for some reason, and uh, I don't know what the science is behind it, but that's one thing it was known for, and it just it just got louder. It's not so much the gain out of this amp that makes it a great rock amp as much as it is the volume. And if you've ever seen Pink Floyd live, then you know why. So, that's it for this list. 14 of the greatest rock amplifiers ever. I hope you enjoy this list. I always, I certainly enjoy putting it together. I always enjoy putting these lists and these videos together. They're a lot of fun for me. Uh, and you guys seem to enjoy them too. So, so, if you haven't already, please make sure and check out the link to uh, Pickers Grip down in the description. They were kind enough to sponsor this video and they, uh, they're, they make a great product. And uh, Billy Cox is an even better guy. So please comment down below. Tell me what are some of your favorite rock amplifiers, knowing that I had to cut this list off somewhere. Uh, I'll post links to uh, all those amps that I mentioned down in the description. Uh, I will also post links to various different ways that you can support this channel down in the subscription. Your support really does go a long way and really does mean a lot. Last but not least, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell if you haven't already. Thank you so much for watching. Adios.